So I'm going to talk about um, engineering conceptual prototypes. Um, and uh, in line with this theme, um, I'll jump right in with a few examples um, of what we might think of as kind of classic standard conceptual engineering, conceptual engineering very broadly being um, attempts to improve or modify um, our representational devices. One well-known um, example of such conceptual engineering um, had to do with the notion of, of a planet, um, as may be familiar to most of the people uh, listening in uh, 2006, the International Astronomical Union uh, revised the definition of planet. Um, they decided that uh, uh, to be a planet, something uh, ought to have to clear its or orbital neighborhood, that is, um, not have an orbit that crosses with anything um, much bigger than it. Uh, and of course, Pluto does not meet that new definition. Um, and so Pluto was, uh, so to speak, demoted uh, from planethood uh, uh, with that new um, new definition being adopted. Um, and so with that revised definition of planet in place, Pluto no longer falls in the extension of the concept planet, whereas it used to uh, used to count as a planet. So that's one um, very well-known example of uh, conceptual engineering that, that took place uh, in, in our lifetimes. Um, a second example of uh, such classic conceptual engineering, now moving to a more sort of social topic, um, has to do with the definition of rape, for instance. Historically, rape uh, did not, um, uh, the, the, the definition of rape did not acknowledge the possibility of rape within a marriage. Um, this view is captured very starkly in um, the quote here from an English jurist, uh, Matthew Hale, uh, who wrote, a husband cannot be guilty of a rape committed by himself upon his lawful wife, for by, by their mutual matrimonial consent and contract, the wife hath given up herself in this kind to her husband, which she cannot retract. So a view according to which the sort of definition of rape rules out the possibility of rape within a marriage. Um, of course, this um, uh, view was, uh, you know, widely uh, rejected by many people and activists in the 19th and especially 20th centuries um, advocated for a broadening of the concept of rape in the United States, um, as well as elsewhere, but I, the information I have here is from uh, the U.S. in particular. Um, the laws really began to change in the 1970s, um, and by 1993, marital rape was a crime nationwide, um, somewhat surprisingly recent. Um, but at this point, um, not only the law, but also common usage of the word rape recognizes um, marital rape as a genuine kind uh, of rape. So that's another example of conceptual engineering where um, a concept is broadened so that new things fall into its extension that didn't fall into it before. So these examples of conceptual engineering focus on concepts as something like the meanings of words, something like intentions um, uh, or definitions. Um, and changes in concepts in this sense result in at least potential changes to the extensions of the corresponding words. So something that used to be a planet no longer is a planet. Something that used to not be rape now can be rape. Um, and Conceptual engineering projects of this sort are, are great. They're often very important. Sometimes they even succeed, right? Um, the examples that I just mentioned seem to have been um, successful, at least in wide swaths of uh, the population. Um, but what I'm going to be focused on today are cases that show that these kinds of conceptual improvements um, don't really exhaust the kinds of conceptual engineering that uh, we might care about as people engaged in, uh, in this practice. So to see why these kinds of classic cases may not exhaust the kinds of conceptual improvement um, that we might be interested in, I wanna consider the following um, statistics. Uh, so first off, right, what motivated the kind of classic conceptual engineering project uh, 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 centering around the concept of rape? Well, it seems like activists who cared about you know, bringing marital rape into the fold of this definition, wanted to call attention to sexual violence within marriage, have better ways to address this very, you know, unfortunately common kind of, of sexual violence. Those are the kinds of social goals that um, were behind this conceptual engineering enterprise. Um, having marital rape count as rape is a step towards that goal. But to sort of expand the picture out, I think we could see that activists 
with very related goals <laughs> to those that motivated that classic project may now care, for instance, about calling attention to how often um, rape and sexual assault are perpetrated by people known to the victim, sometimes called acquaintance rape. Um, and as we can see from um, the statistics that I have up on the slide, this is um, you know, a, a very large proportion of um, uh, cases of, of rape. Approximately eight out of 10 um, are perpetrated by people who are known to the victim. Only roughly 20% are committed by um, a stranger. And this is something that people who have sort of goals continuous with those who, who, who were focused on marital rape um, um, might want to call attention to. So this raises the question, like, is there still some conceptual engineering of the concept rape left to be done? Um, and I think you might think the answer is yes here, that there could be some work left to be done if you have those same kinds of goals of, again, calling attention to and addressing very prevalent forms of sexual violence. Um, and the issue is that when many people think of rape, um, the sort of image that comes to mind is a kind of dark alley attack by a stranger or something like that. Um, whereas, as we just saw, um, statistics show that this covers roughly 20% of rapes um, and, and the vast majority don't look anything like that. Now, it's not that the other 80% with perpetrators known to victims don't yet fall into the extension of the concept, right? That's not the right way to describe what people might be getting wrong here. Um, but they aren't what first come to mind for, for many people. And I think we can spell out what's going on here by appealing to um, conceptual prototypes. So just to give a little bit of background on this, um, those who approach conceptual engineering more from the direction of psychology and cognitive science um, often take concepts uh, roughly to be bodies of information that are retrieved by default when reasoning um, about a given category. And at least part of that can be cashed out in terms of a prototype for that category. Um, such prototypes encode statistical information about the properties that are characteristic of the kind. So to use a simple example, we might think of the prototype um, for the concept apple to include like red for the color dimension, round for shape, um, and so on. More fully, if we want to spell out the kind of um, statistical distributions of features, um, we could think of the prototype for Apple as encoding like along the color dimension, 70% um, red, 25% green, 5% yellow, um, and similarly for other kinds of, of features. Now, prototypes um, are useful for you know, many reasons outside of conceptual engineering. They are especially useful for explaining so-called typicality effects. Um, in psychology, so classic studies from um, Eleanor Roche and collaborators um, showed that you know, the more typical um, instances of the kind correlated with lower numbers of errors, quicker response times, um, and things like that. Um, a disclaimer, uh, for my purposes today, I'm not uh, committing to the sort of full prototype theory of concepts. This is a theory of like what concepts are that just identifies a concept with um, a prototype. Um, I am not especially inclined to um, accept that, and I certainly am, do not want to be on the hook uh, uh, for arguing for it here. Instead, um, what I'm going to say today um, takes the picture rather to be that there are concepts as something like definitions or intentions and associated conceptual prototypes, which can explain these psychological associations and typicality effects and these, you know, um, the sort of default reasoning that we um, uh, engage with when we encounter or think about um, uh, uh, the given category. And what I want to suggest is that um, Focusing on prototypes in our theory of concepts can give us a fuller picture of what conceptual engineering um, can involve, uh, as well as how it can be implemented. Okay, so this brings me to my main goals for um, my talk today. Um, I want to explore some advantages of taking um, prototype engineering seriously, that is the engineering of conceptual prototypes, as opposed to the engineering of um, concepts as uh, intentions or word meanings. Um, and first of all, um, very simply, it brings this 
this um, perspective brings into the fold of conceptual engineering some projects that seem continuous in their concerns with these more classic conceptual engineering projects that I introduced um, at the outset, um, but that don't target meanings um, slash definitions. Um, furthermore, uh, focusing on prototypes um, can open up some avenues for avoiding certain challenges um, that face uh, quote unquote classic conceptual engineering. Um, in particular, I'll, I'll mention um, issues related to topic continuity and um, implementation. And then finally, um, I think that this uh, prototype picture um, uh, invites and um, makes possible some really interesting connections between conceptual engineering and machine learning. So I'll spell that out more uh, as we go through. So uh, let's return to the example um, of rape that I mentioned earlier. Um, what I want to suggest is that the activist's work that you think could still remain when it comes to uh, raising awareness about, say, acquaintance rape, is to engineer the prototype associated with the concept of rape. And again, um, just to emphasize, these cases of assault already fall into the extension of the concept, right? So, you know, it's not like people are saying that like, oh, you know, you describe a case of like date rape or something and they say that doesn't count as rape, right? I mean, maybe some people have that view, but that's not the kind of um, reaction that is of, um, of interest to me here. Instead, um, the, the, the interest here is in people who say, oh, yeah, if you present them with a case, of you know forced sexual contact by an acquaintance, they would acknowledge yes that is rape, but still, um, without that kind of description, the first thing that comes to mind um, in connection with this category is not that it's this kind of dark alley situation. So, if that's um, the kind of situation we're imagining, then it's not that the kind of classic conceptual engineering is needed. We don't need something that doesn't fall into the extension to uh, you know come to fall into the extension of the concept. Um, still, the same goals of those earlier classic uh, project um, of better addressing the whole range of sexual violence facing people also, I think, demand a change um, to the conceptual prototype so that people more readily think of and associate um, rape with the acquaintance variety rather than the sort of dark alley stranger variety. Um, and there are other cases that we can um, also use to illustrate the need for um, prototype engineering. So there's a well-known um, uh, draw a scientist test um, that's been carried out over the decades, um, originally um, by social scientist David uh, Chambers between 1966 and 1977, asked thousands of elementary school children to just draw a scientist. That's the whole, um, that's the whole instruction. Um, of the almost 5,000 drawings, uh, just 28 um, depicted a female scientist, and all of those were drawn by girls. Um, this has been repeated in, in various other contexts. Um, more recent studies uh, uh, from the 80s, still not super recent. I'm not sure what the even more recent data suggests, but more recent studies had an average of 28% 28, 28 now <laughs> of children drawing female scientists. So you might think that these um, results of this draw a scientist test um, reveal something about the prototypical scientist, right? It reveals that the um, prototypical scientist is, is male. Um, and again, the problem here is not that the like meaning of scientist precludes uh, women scientists, um, but still those concerned with gender equity might want to change these default associations that people make when they think of um, a scientist. And in other words, this is to say that there is work to do um, engineering the conceptual prototype for scientists to be less skewed towards um, the male. Okay, now there are some payoffs of focusing on prototype engineering um, that have to do with some you know, well-known challenges to conceptual engineering. So one of these um, is to address in what sense a kind of topic of in inquiry is preserved even in the face of conceptual change. Um, one way that this challenge is presented goes back to um, Strassen who objected to Carnap's um, approach to philosophy. And Strassen wrote that to offer formal explanations of key terms um, of scientific theories to one who seeks philosophical illumination of essential concepts of non-scientific discourse is to do something utterly irrelevant. Um, typical philosophical problems about the concepts used in non-scientific discourse cannot be solved by laying down the rules of exact and fruitful concepts in science. To do this last is not to solve the typical philosophical problem, but to change the subject. 
So the idea here is that um, the worry is that that in changing um, a concept, you just talk about something else, not the thing that people were worried about in the first place. Um, so there isn't a kind of link or continuity between um, the initial problem and the proposed solution. Now, <laughs> there are many promising responses to this challenge as it's been posed for the more sort of classic um, conceptual engineering. And um, I'm not going to say anything to undermine those here. In fact, I'm quite sympathetic to, um, to many of them. But I just want to um, uh, also make the point that if we take the conceptual engineering of prototypes seriously, it opens up a further way of thinking about topic continuity in conceptual engineering. Um, and it's, this is the following, that in cases where um, it's the prototypes that are, that are the problem, we can engineer those while keeping the concept as meaning unchanged, right? So if we take the case of um, scientists, for instance, there's clear continuity even as we um, might shift the sort of distribution of gender to be more equal across male and female. Um, it's still um, the same individuals that will count as scientists. It's still the same um, uh, the same intention or same meaning for the word in the sense of determining truth conditions, but you can still change the, um, the, the, the prototype associated with it. So if we think that engineering conceptual prototypes can be important, we can not worry about topic preservation. Um, topic preservation um, is ensured through continuity of meaning, um, but we still have room to improve um, our concepts in important ways, uh, namely through uh, changing the prototype. Okay. Um, another often discussed problem for conceptual engineering has to do with implementation. Um, how to actually implement conceptual engineering proposals. Um, we can distinguish a more theoretical version and a more practical version of this problem. Um, the theoretical version, whoops, um, the theoretical version asks like, is there something about the nature of concepts that might actually make it like impossible for us to intentionally uh, change them? And then there's a more practical version, which is like, even if you think it is possible in theory um, to change concepts, is it practically feasible to do so given um, the contingent limitations of our situation? So I'll say a, a bit about each of these in connection to um, engineering conceptual prototypes. Um, when it comes to the theoretical version of the implementation worry, the doubts often trace back to semantic externalism. And the idea is that if um, the meanings of words are fixed by factors largely, at least independent of the mental states of speakers, um, what hopes do we have of changing them in a goal-driven, intentional way? Um, again, many uh, possible responses to this worry, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to many of them. Um, but what I want to focus on here is just how things look if we're focusing on um, prototypes. And focusing on conceptual prototypes allows us in a way to sidestep the worry, because even if meanings um, are fixed once and for all, um, there is still important conceptual engineering work um, left to do on, on the prototypes, that those can change again, even while meanings um, in the sense of intentions remain fixed. Um, however, we might worry that there's a kind of related implementation problem um, for um, prototype engineering. Um, and I'll, I'll just comment on this briefly, although this leads to some of the open questions that I have that I would be interested to hear um, people's thoughts about. Um, so the prototype for a concept encodes statistical information about the category. Um, and you might think that because of this, that a, a, a proposed new conceptual prototype, an engineered prototype, is not going to be able to stick in the community if the perceived world pattern connected to that category remains unchanged. This is a worry raised by um, Eleanor Neufeld in a talk in this same series um, just a month or two ago, or maybe a few weeks ago. Um, so what, what Neufeld holds is that the that she, so she thinks this is a serious worry for changing conceptual prototypes, and she thinks that the way around it is to um, recognize that concepts encode not only um, typical features um, embodied in the prototype, but also causal information. So the example she um, used here is, uh, has to do with a pit bull and how you know someone might want to change the prototype of pit bull from being associated with like uh, uh, aggression to being associated with friendliness or something. And her idea is like, look, 
this isn't going to work if people st still keep on getting um, examples of pit bulls in their life that that display aggression. Um, the prototype of friendliness um, isn't isn't gonna isn't gonna be able to stick. And the solution that she proposes is like, well, let's not try to change the prototype to have um, a higher weight to friendliness than aggression. Instead try to build in the causal information that like, if roughly, if a pit bull is aggressive, it's because of bad owners, not because of something about the nature of pit bulls themselves. Um, and that um, causal information is fully compatible with the same patterns that we've been observing in the world and is more likely to stick and still have some good consequences when it comes to our um, dealings with, with pit bulls. Um, now, I think this idea of engineering concepts by changing these kinds of causal um, uh, assumptions that we associate with them is, is super interesting. And I think that could often be um, called for. Um, but I do want to suggest that there's um, a little more optimism when it comes to engineering prototypes themselves. I don't think we should be quite so pessimistic that proposed changes to prototypes could never stick. Um, and I'll say a bit about why. Um, and the reason why I think um, we should be a bit more optimistic about engineering prototypes is that after all, the prototype um, for a given concept often doesn't correspond to like the true <laughs> statistical patterns in the world, right? Um, it's based on perceived patterns, which includes not just direct observations of category members, but also like stories we hear, media portrayals, um, and, and so on. And this comes out very starkly in the example of rape, right? We saw that the prototypical instance um, is not the most common kind in the world, in fact, far from it. Um, and this kind of situation where you have a mismatch between the prototype and the actual sort of facts on the ground, so to speak, um, suggests that engineered conceptual prototypes can stick if we are influencing those kinds of indirect perceptions of the category in order to make them align better with the true patterns. And that I think is what, like if someone has a prototype engineering project connected to rape, the goal would be to try to change, um, you know, public discussion about it in such a way that people um, are, um, uh, you know, made more aware of the actual truly more common instance and thereby change um, the prototype and continue to reinforce that change because um, the sort of public discussion um, better aligns with the facts. So of course, this is changing the perceived patterns, but that's exactly what goes into conceptual engineering. After all, conceptual engineering doesn't succeed just by people like, you know, flipping a switch in their head. It often does have to involve um, a lot of sort of avenues of influence. Um, there is an open question that I have about this um, that I will not answer in the talk, um, but I'm curious if anyone has any thoughts about uh, whether there are ever um, good reasons to engineer a prototype to make it diverge more from the true patterns. Um, so the examples that um, that I've been talking about seem to be ones where um, the, uh, the the sort of prototype doesn't line up with the reality, and we may want to you know engineer it to give people a more accurate view of like the kind of sexual violence we have to um, be aware of and, and fight against. Um, whether there could be uh, conceptual engineering projects that actually um, call for a move in the opposite direction, I think is a, a question worth considering. Okay. Um, moving on to the practical version of the implementation problem, we might ask, okay, so maybe you agree that conceptual engineering is theoretically possible, but is it practically feasible? Um, now, here, you know, I think there are really no easy answers when it comes to either classic conceptual engineering on, you know, co concepts as meaning or prototype engineering. They are certainly both going to be hard, um, and how hard is going to depend partly on the scope of one's goals. What, you know, what linguistic community do you want to influence? Um, in what context, and so on. Um, However, I will say a bit more about this um, later in my talk because I think the connections with um, machine learning that prototype engineering opens up suggest some interesting new methods for practical implementation um, that may make it, uh, um, I don't know, less daunting than uh, before. So um, I'll, I'll return to that a bit later. Okay, so let me then get into some of these connections with machine learning. Um, Large language models, people are probably somewhat familiar with them through tools like ChatGPT, BARD, and so on. Um, these are, of course, uh, very good at mimicking human language use. And 
because of that, you might think that their use, um, quote unquote, of language um, can surely give us some insight into the concepts of human language users. The human language users, after all, whose data uh, is what trained these models to be such good mimickers. Um, it's not, however, totally straightforward how to draw that connection. And so the idea that I want to work towards is that conceptual prototypes can help us make that connection. Um, and I'll also mention that this section of my talk is based um, partly on joint work with um, Eli Sheck, one of my colleagues here at Auburn, as well as um, Mike Tamir, uh, a data scientist um, and um, also lecturer at UC Berkeley. Okay, I'll also mention that I will discuss some offensive stereotypes um, in this part of my talk. So I want to go back um, before working my way to the back to the, the um, conceptual prototype idea. Just go back to um, some examples of uh, gender bias in machine learning, um, the kinds of things that raise people's worries about these um, uh, uh, for quite a while. This example is um, somewhat ancient history when it comes to this field from 2016. Word embeddings that are kind of the um, ancestor of uh, the technology that lies behind ChatGPT. Um, and basically, these word embeddings um, were found to encode um, pretty blatant um, gender bias. Uh, the title of the paper mentions one of them, man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker. Um, basically, these vectors associated with words found that the relationship between men and computer programmer is like mirrored with the relationship between woman and homemaker, um, clearly um, reflecting uh, some some gender stereotypes there. Um, this is a table from oops, um, this is a table from the paper uh, 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 reviewing some of the other gendered analogies that these word embeddings identified: sewing, sewing carpentry, nurse, surgeon. Um, some of them are kind of funny: um, cupcakes, pizza. Yeah, that's the funniest one probably. Um, and then of course there are other. Um, uh, giggle, chuckle. Um, and then, of course, there are other, you know, gender pairs that are not, you know, don't seem to embody um, problematic stereotypes, but just the, the actual meanings of words like king and queen and sister and brother um, and mother and father. Um, so it's not that all of the gender associations are uh, biased, but it's it's picking up on some that, that seem to be. Um, Moving a little bit forward in time, GPT-2, um, I guess we're now at GPT-4, so this is from a few years ago already. Um, GPT-2 test continuations had some pretty shocking um, outputs. Um, for the prompt, the man worked as uh, blank. We get car salesman. Uh, for the prompt, the woman worked as blank. Uh, we get uh, prostitute. Um, so this is this is pretty blatant. Um, ChatGPT won't do anything quite this blatant, but as we'll see, there are still some um, examples of this kind of bias that ChatGPT um, and other uh, current tools are, are still subject to. Um, another example, this time from GPT three, um, uh, some uh, uh, Islamophobic. Um, outputs. These researchers were asking it to um, generate jokes and found that when the joke, uh, the premise of the joke involved Muslims, um, it was much more likely to lead to sort of violent continuations um, than when the subject was Christians. Um, coming to some more recent examples with ChatGPT, again, you know, there, there's been some changes to avoid some of the most um, blatant bias, but um, this is a, a example where um, this person asked ChatGPT to tell me a story about a boy and a girl, girl choosing their careers. The boy became um, a successful doctor, the girl a beloved teacher, so same old, same old. Um, and um, this poster continues, I know there's a lot of promise in ChatGPT and other such tools. I also know that a lot of racism and hatred has been edited out, but it is still not fit for purpose as long as it churns out these harmful stereotypes. Um, and lest we think that that was just kind of a fluke, I also did some um, experimenting myself with ChatGPT um, a couple of months back. And um, and, and the patterns you know, did seem to hold. I was also asking it to tell me a story about a boy and a girl choosing their careers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 
we get, you know, Alex has been, whoops, Alex has been fascinated by technology and how it could shape the future. Lily has a deep passion for art and a desire to touch people's lives through her creativity. Um, I just have a few examples in the slides here. Um, here's another one where Ryan has been fascinated with science, um, has a natural curiosity for understanding how uh, things work to Emily, a deep love for music and a gift for cap captivating others with her voice. So fairly gender stereotypical um, results here. Um, I won't read through all of all of the examples. Um, I also uh, did, again, this is very, uh, some very preliminary exploratory uh, tests, although um, some, some other people have quantified this more rigorously too, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I did some preliminary exploratory tests with, with gender, um, well, with professions in ChatGPT to see what gender assumptions um, it would make. So I asked it to write, you know, very short story about an X and a Y where the X and Y are subbed in for um, uh, profession terms. So doctor, nurse, a lawyer, artist, partner in a law firm and lawyer and movie director, actor. Um, I wanted to do ones other than the classic doctor, nurse because I wasn't sure if if the um, uh, programmers behind ChatGPT might have like, I don't know, been aware of some of the most stereotypical ones and kind of worked against it and how how it would it might differ across different professions. So again, in a very preliminary way, I did 10 iterations of each of these pairs. Um, and these were the results um, that I got. So it's not, you know, all stereotypical, but um, about half, uh, a bit more than half were stereotypical in at least one respect and almost half were, well, 42% were stereotypical in every way. Um, a little more than a quarter were anti-stereotypical. That is sort of the um, flipped genders from what you would expect based on traditional gender stereotypes. And then um, about a fifth um, had just no genders specified. They just say, oh, the doctor did this, the, the nurse did that. And they don't say who, uh, they, they don't give them genders. Um, <clears throat> there were some interesting differences across the pairs of professions. Um, uh, so doctor and nurse had a higher proportion of fully anti-stereotypical results than like movie director and actor, um, which was just kind of interesting to me. Um, again, very preliminary, but I thought it was, um, yeah, kind of telling uh, that these patterns, while maybe not as blatant as they were in some earlier uh, machine learning tools, are still are still very much there. Um, this was the only case where they made the movie director a woman um, in my uh, in my experiments, and I thought this was just kind of amusing because the movie director is is named Sophia. So I think that says something about um, in what context female movie directors are discussed in in the training data for ChatGPT. Um, there are also examples that people have discussed online. Um, uh, of ChatGPT having trouble with pronouns when the pronouns seem to go against the sort of stereotypical associations for the terms. So this is a chat posted by a linguist Hadas Kotek. Um, the doctor yelled at the nurse because she was late. Who was late? Okay, ChatGPT says the nurse was late. Then um, she asked the nurse yelled at the doctor because she was late. Who was late? And then it says still it is the nurse who was late. Um, the doctor yelled at the nurse because he was late. Who was late? In this sentence, the doctor being late, late seems to make seems to be a mistake or a typographical error because it does not logically fit with the rest of the sentence. So you can see how it's sort of getting confused when the way you would normally resolve these pronouns given gender stereotypes doesn't really fit with um, the the sentence or the question otherwise. Um, and this was quantified um, by Kapoor and Marianan, um, and they showed that uh, GPT 3.5, which um, powers ChatGPT, um, was 2.8 times more likely to answer anti-stereotypical questions incorrectly compared to stereotypical questions. Um, and GPT 4 um, uh, was uh, 3.2 times more likely um, to do so. Okay. Um, so that, that those are some examples of the bias that still um, pervades these uh, tools. And what I want to suggest is that the bias revealed by large language models like GBT um, can be captured in terms of prototypes. 
So recall that a prototype um, encodes statistical information about the typical features of a kind. So for example, for the concept apple, um, the color dimension could be assigned like 70% red, 25% green, 5% yellow. Um, and the thing to note is that this kind of distribution is exactly what large language models encode as well. So large language models are basically doing a kind of um, fill in the blank task, right? Or find the, the most likely continuation um, uh, based on some prompt. And it's going to represent some distribution of possible um, responses. Um, and if the uh, language model is sort of a good one, the probability distribution that it predicts should match with what you know, a user of the language would actually say. Um, so large language models generate um, a distribution over potentially uh, appropriate subsequent terms in a string. So for instance, uh, primed with apples are the color blank, we might expect the distribution from which the output is going to be chosen to have that same probability mass assignments like 70% red, 25% green, 5% yellow. Obviously somewhat simplified, but that's the idea. And this should reflect if that is the LLM is trained on an appropriate data set, um, that should reflect the empirical dispositions of competent users of the concept Apple, thus providing evidence about that concept. There's a meaningful sense in which the outputs of these models give some insight into the concepts of the language users who created that data in the first place. Um, and so coming back to the bias case, the, for instance, GPT-2 text continuation um, that I mentioned a bit earlier shows that um, implicit in our language use is, or at least was, um, a stronger association between woman uh, and prostitute along the work dimension and a correspondingly strong association between um, man and car, car salesman. Um, and, uh, these tools have been used explicitly by some researchers to um, to examine like the change in um, uh, associations across time. For example, this study that um, uh, looked at gender and ethnic stereotypes across time using historical corpus data. So the idea that these outputs can be a kind of window into the implicit associations that people make is, is not new. And again, if you think that um, concepts, at least part of what a concept is, is that kind of um, default association, then these tools are um, giving a window into our concepts. Um, so the outputs of a well-trained language model, as I was just saying, can be a window into our concepts. And sometimes these are gonna reveal things about them that we might wanna change, that we might want to engineer away, that we might wanna take as um, the targets of our conceptual engineering uh, projects. Now, debiasing is a um, uh, common practice in machine learning. It's the process of removing machine learned patterns um, uh, that are deemed to exhibit problematic bias. Um, so, you know, the, the thing that makes ChatGPT not quite as, you know, uh, bad as some of the earlier versions is because people have gone in and debiased it and said, you know, take away some of these associations between like Muslim and violent, for instance. Um, uh, you know, don't have, you know, every example of a doctor that you give be, be a man, only have, you know, 50% or maybe a little more than 50%, but at least not all of them. Um, now, debiasing a language model uh, certainly does not automatically mean a change in the concepts of human language users. Um, those are two different things, but I wanna suggest um, it can be a tool to help with conceptual engineering, um, especially if we're thinking about engineering prototypes. Um, this is just uh, an illustration of one of the main techniques for debiasing um, LLMs called reinforcement learning with human feedback, where basically you have, I don't know if you can see my mouse actually. Um, anyway, uh, on the left-hand side, whoops. Um, on the left-hand side, you have the kind of initial language model that does um, incorporate significant hidden biases because they're present in the training data. And then you have, um, you're gonna try to train a second model called the reward model that can provide feedback to that initial model that will basically like punish it when it says stuff that seems uh, bad or biased or violates norms in various ways. Um, so this is one way that um, ChatGPT um, avoids some of the most egregious um, outputs because um, there are people and we should acknowledge often not very well paid people who actually have to sift through possible responses and, and rank them and say which ones um, should be um, allowed and which ones shouldn't be allowed. 
And that, of course, and that, and that then is used to further train the um, language model so that you don't actually have people making you know, every decision, but people train the reward model, which can then um, train uh, a new model that uh, will do better than the initial one. Um, and this is just an example of some of the uh, guidelines that, for instance, Google gives its um, uh, its uh, rankers for like what you know what to allow and what not to allow. And one of the things that they explicitly say um, not to allow are stereotypes or harmful generalizations about groups of people. You can see that in the top left. Um, so uh, what I want to suggest is that de-biased. Um, large language models can help with the implementation of certain kinds of conceptual engineering projects. Um, and the potential here really only increases as people engage more and more with um, language models in, in our day-to-day -day life, which probably will only be going up uh, from here on out. Now, this doesn't do away with every worry you might have about implementation. For instance, if you are still really worried about the whole externalism stuff, you might um, not be moved by this, um, at least for you know, the classic conceptual engineering cases. Um, but if you think that, you know, implementing conceptual engineering is um, doable, but pretty difficult, um, then having the help of tools like ChatGPT could be welcome because they just, um, they're the scale is just so much greater than what, you know, individual speakers can, can achieve just through their own day-to-day -day conversations. If ChatGPT is talking in a way that reinforces better um, uh, conceptual prototypes, for instance, you might hope that that could have more of an influence um, than, than other potential ways of, of implementing conceptual engineering. Um, and at the very least, um, we don't want large language models or other AI tools um, to work against our conceptual engineering goals. And one thing that's come out um, in some uh, research is that um, left to their own devices, you might worry that they actually are even worse <laughs> than we are. So this is from um, uh, an article um, uh, about uh, this issue when it comes to image generation, um, humans are biased, generative AI is even worse. And this was talking about stable diffusions, um, text to image generator. And basically this found that um, the image generator was really, really exaggerating <laughs> um, gender imbalances um, in their outputs. So for example, um, with the arrow in the in this figure, so that women make up 39% of doctors, but only 7% um, of the image results of doctors were women. So um, we had a, a great mismatch between um, the sort of gender uh, uh, reality when it comes to who is a doctor and what this um, machine learning tool was um, was generating. And, and you can see that this came up with a lot of um, a lot of other professions where like, yes, there is a gender imbalance in the world, but it's even worse in this image generator. And um, even if you're a bit skeptical about like, huge changes in our concepts being affected by um, ChatGPT or, or, or image generators or things like this. Um, at the very least, we should want them to help us not get even worse <laughs> um, on, on these fronts. Um, so these results suggest that debiasing um, in machine learning may be needed, even if our goal is just concept preservation, um, which is arguably a variety of conceptual engineering um, itself, um, even if uh, we are more skeptical about the loftier goals of having it, um, uh, you know, change our conceptual associations in, in deeper ways. Um, I'll also just note that I have been focusing here on conceptual engineering projects that involve debiasing conceptual prototypes. Um, I think there is some potential for machine learning to help with more classic conceptual engineering projects too. This is something um, explored in some in-progress work by Jessica Pepp and Rachel Sturkin. Um, they talk about how, you know, if you have uh, your your AI kind of classify surprising things under a category, maybe that can actually help people, you know, rethink um, uh, concepts as meanings, um, uh, not just the kinds of, um, uh, yeah, prototypical associations that I'm focused on. Although I shouldn't say just because I think they're actually really important. And a lot of the problems with our conceptual repertoire, repertoire that we should care about for social purposes um, fall into the category of um, problems with prototypes, not necessarily problems with um, meanings. Okay, 
So I'll just sum up some of the main points. Um, so uh, as we saw at the outset, some you know most standard examples of conceptual engineering um, involve changing concepts by changing corresponding word meanings. But you know, engineering conceptual prototypes uh, is a thing too. Um, it's a thing that's worth um, bringing into the fold. I mean, of course, people have already brought it into the fold, but I want to focus on some advantages of doing so. Um, and we can see prototype engineering coming apart from um, meaning engineering in both directions, right? We can change prototypes without changing meaning as intention. Um, and on the flip side, we can also change um, meaning without changing prototypes. Um, so, uh, for instance, you might think that you know the the move to incorporate um, marital rape into the definition of rape that that changed something, right? It changed the meaning. Um, it changed what falls into the extension of rape, but arguably maybe it did not change the prototype. There was still some work, work left to be done. Um, and now if we succeed in changing the prototype to better reflect um, actual prevalence of different kinds of um, sexual assault in the world, um, that would involve changing the prototype without necessarily changing um, the meaning any further. Um, recognizing this kind of prototype engineering offers new avenues to respond to some challenges that face concept, uh, classic conceptual engineering. Um, and as I've been spelling out um, in the last part of the talk, it can allow us to draw some fruitful connections between conceptual engineering and machine learning. All right, thanks.